it's important to mentor younger generations, you know, so that they can um, succeed um, and learn. You know, we didn't really have that when we started off, and it was really challenging. And we we'd love for it to be uh, easier for the younger g- generations to, to succeed. Um, they're our future, you know, and you know, I'm myself too. I'm still learning every day, so. Uh, you know, events like EDM Biz is is great for um, people in the business, people aspiring to get into the business, to idea share and to learn. You know, for a minute there, things were being pushed into like traditional concert style, where you buy your ticket, you get your rip it rip ticket ripped upon entry, and you stare at the artist and you just gaze at him. And when he's off, you get pushed out of the venue. You know, that's not what we're doing here. This is not a concert. This is a community getting together and connecting and, and dancing, there's, and, and, you know, and listening to the best music there is, but uh, you know, there's a lot of other art forms that are um, featured as well. And you know, that's, that's the difference. You know? So we don't want to lose that magic. That's, that's what helps these events be so unique is, 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 is the roots of it all. You know? where it all started is important to, to bring into the now because we don't want to lose that. The beautiful thing about the rave scene is everything was generated by us. You know, we weren't relying on big corporations, but it was small and homespun in a way. And what I found so fascinating and gratifying is to see how, like the success of EDC, it's not the success of a huge corporation coming in and manufacturing something for kids. It's self-generated, you know, and ultimately it comes from this place of love and enthusiasm, you know, it's, and I find that, so 20 years on for EDC, uh, 20 years, I don't, know, has, I don't know how long Insomniac's been around, longer than that. And it's, at some point in all of our lives, we encountered this culture that we fell in love with and that was really special. And we sort of have all become evangelists for it. You know, we want to share it with our friends and we want to share it with other people and with new generations, but it's this this love for this phenomenal culture of weird electronic dance music. And it's just really gratifying to see that it's lasted as long as it's lasted and that it's so big and it's reached so many people and there's so many other people who have shared our love for that moment. You know, that, that amazing moment when you're with 10 people or 100 people or 100,000 people and you hear a piece of music that just resonates with you and that transcends. The, the format of radio has been around for like 100 years. And even though we have different outlets now, digital radio, uh, you know, streaming, whatever, it's still basically the same thing. It's this little box or this little knob in your car, you switch it on and somebody talking to you, whether you're sad or happy, this, this radio is, is, radio is all about the now, a track from the future you put into the now a really big track from the past that people want to hear now you make it now and radio is all about the power of now because you are the dj you are the link between the past and the future you make it current and the, the only thing that you you can you cannot change the past you cannot predict the future but you can do something now and that is for me the power of radio so it's a very powerful medium and i to be honest when i started my radio show a lot of my colleagues thought i was crazy for doing a two-hour radio show every week and uh, a lot of these guys that thought I was crazy are having their own radio shows right now. You see, so <clears throat> it, it, it was n- it was never like a business thing because for eight years I didn't make a single dime with the state of trance. It just it was labor of love. But the spinoff from the state of trance brought me Armada, brought me success with gigs, gave me the space to organize my own events and all that sort of stuff. So the radio is very very powerful. Well, I think for EDM to have a future, we need to know our history. We need to be inclusive and understand the full potential. Everything from 
really arty, esoteric forms of dance music, all the way up to the most commercial form of dance music. If we can be inclusive, I think it's a stronger base for us. Um, I think as humans, you know, as we try and establish an ecosystem that works and a common language that we share, I think it's just natural to congregate, you know, to create these forums where we can reflect all of the energy that's out there. You know, in the very early days of the scene, it was just chaos, you know, because no one really had a game plan. It was just an underground music movement. So over the years, as we spent more time, invested more in this community, we realized that we got to start to build a map, you know, we need a road map. Where are we going? What's the meaning of all this? And so that's a little bit of, of what EDM is about. Um, and the conference is the perfect complement to it. And also, I have to say, a really smart piece in EDC week, you know, leading up to the big festival, the largest festival in the country. It just makes perfect sense with all of the activity, people coming here, that we have more things to, to get involved in here in Vegas leading up to uh, the big show. America's sound has evolved so much that it's it's almost created its own genres that don't have a place in the UK simply because um, we, we've never been introduced to it. But things like um, the deeper UK sound has now become popular in the in the US, like Gorgon City, Disclosure, Duke Dumont, because as EDM's grown, people that are into it have obviously searched more and more and dug deeper than just the big hard stuff. It's you know they become more educated and they've wanted to you know, search out new genres and as part of that the UK sound has become involved in the US scene I, I guess. But then I suppose things like trap and uh, sort of this electronic, uh, this heavy electro sound um, like people like Jaws and OK and Marshmallow who I, who I like, I like their sound, for some reason isn't translating back, do you know what I mean? But maybe it will, you never know, maybe we will take your lead. EDM for me has always been uh, just part of growing up because I learned to DJ when I was 17. So I've been DJing for about seven, eight years now and I've always incorporated EDM and just music in general into my life and into what I do. So that also includes anything on social media. So yeah. Used to maybe be that um, England was dominating the DJ scene, uh, you know, at first um, when it really got big. But now we see people coming from all over the world, uh, being very uh, talented DJs. Not at the last place, the US has brought forward like a lot of really uh, talented DJs. So it's um, for me, it's almost like a normal result that when you have a conference like this where everybody comes together to talk, you know, more and more people from outside of the US and outside of Vegas, you know, come out here to catch a, a glimpse of that. Yeah getting people to understand uh, that it's personal responsibility and taking care of their friends and taking care of everybody else, uh, that will lead to a, a safer festival, not only for EDC, but uh, safer festivals around the world. If I can reach one person and to get a conversation starting with just one person and maybe make them think twice about the decisions that they were going to make this weekend, I think that I've truly succeeded in what I'm trying to do. Um, and also just getting the general conversation about harm reduction and, and what does that mean and what is actually the definition of harm reduction and what exactly does the RAVAC mean and, and getting that conversation going and getting that conversation going with a group of young people. And those are obviously not terms that are discussed in, in university or in high school, um, whereas other topics are. So, you know, anytime that I can help facilitate a conversation amongst young people. I'm, I'm really proud to do it and I uh, really look forward to, to continuing that in the future. Well, I think that, you know, for us as entrepreneurs, any, any you know, um, worthwhile entrepreneur understands the um, importance of forecasting uh, the industry and trends. And I think that here, um, our main goal, at least the perception from the outside, you know, we'll, we'll find out is that we'll be able to get a beat on what is coming and be able to plan accordingly to address the needs of the industry and not just Freedom Raver, but kind of mesh those together and see is it something that is still viable you know, in that sense. It was scary to come to Vegas. Yeah, very scary. Um, I didn't know if the fans <coughs> would come. You know, uh, Vegas, I think, was foreign to hardcore dance music fans, the clubbers know 
bottle service models and bottles and all that. No, you know, the people, and, people and would you, coming. And would your core audience from LA drive all the way here? That yeah, the core question. audience wasn't, you know, coming to Vegas frequently, not the majority of them. I didn't know if they were going to come. It was definitely a risk, but the, the um, and it's, it, you know, now it seems so um, obvious or simple, you know, but it was really something that, it was a huge risk. You know, we lost, I lost $3 million that I didn't have the first year I did EDC Vegas. Um, so blood, blood spilt again. Yeah, blood split exactly. Um, but yeah, you know things definitely changed. Vegas was, I believe, is the entertainment capital of the world. I feel like, you know, when we were at the LA Coliseum, no one. It seemed like no one was watching. The world wasn't watching. Mm -hmm. It was very LA focused. Well said. And when we came to Vegas, something happened. You know. Um, and it just, it exploded, and we saw the whole city change, and, and you know, um, I, I, I do believe that we, we were part of that. Definitely you know? a trickle down. Ultimately, the goal of music and the goal of trying to write a book, it's very, the similarity is you're trying to communicate something emotional pertaining to your own experience that will hopefully resonate with other people. Uh, the one thing I find about writing a book, though, is you can't ever cheat. You know, like I'm sure if there are lots of musicians here, you know, we get to cheat a lot when we're writing music. Like you write a chorus, and you're like, oh, I like that, copy and paste. You know, or it's like, oh, those vocals aren't very good, I'll just put auto-tune on it. Or, huh, I don't like this singer, let me bring in that singer. When you're writing a book, you can't copy and paste. Like, you can't say, oh, I've written a paragraph that I love, and just copy and paste it and keep inserting it throughout the book. So, that was really interesting, knowing that, like, each little word has to be looked after, and is ultimately as naked and vulnerable as every other word in the book. And and like, I, you can't, like, you can't put reverb on a word in a book. Absolutely, and I, I feel like the book is much more open and vulnerable uh, than, than a song where you're kind of dressing it up with um, effect and context um, in an album. But was there, were there things that you were hesitant to really get into in the book? Because I feel there's a lot of very personal stuff that you laid bare. I mean, it's interesting. When I meet people who've read the book, they kind of look at me like, are, are you okay? I'm like, I don't, probably not. But, uh, yeah, because I, before I wrote the book, I went out and read a bunch of other music memoirs and a bunch of other sort of quasi-public figure memoirs, and I figured out what they did right and what they seemed to do wrong. And the two things that bothered me in a lot of music memoirs were when the musician wasn't willing to be honest and vulnerable, you know, when they tried to present themselves as someone they weren't, you know, someone cooler, someone more disaffected. Uh, and I wanted, so as a result, when I wrote this, I wanted to just be as honest and at times vulnerable as I knew how to be. Because I feel like, especially the culture in which, which we live, like, there's so much disingenuousness and it makes me tired after a while. Like, I'm sure you encounter this all the time. You have people who come onto your show and, like, they're not being honest, they're not being themselves, they're trying to convince you and anyone listening to believe in the sort of manufactured idea of who they are. And some people do it really well, but more often than not, it just feels dishonest. At this point, and this might sound a little odd, but like the joy that I get in making music or talking to you or writing a book, it's none of it for me is leading to anything else. You know, like writing a book to me is its own reward. You know, so if someone buys it, that's fine. If someone reads it and likes it, that's fine. But really, the primary joy that I got from it was sitting down and writing it. And it's the same thing with making music. Like, I don't, I don't think of music as leading to anything else. You know, like I don't want, I don't want to think about, maybe this is a, at an EDM biz conference, this might be a bad thing to say, but I'm not interested in like brand development or career development. Like to me, music is precious and beautiful in and of itself. Like it, it can't lead to anything better than music.
or what else is on your list that you want to accomplish? Uh, well, I have a two, five, and ten year plan in my head. I don't really want to tell too much about it, but first of all, on the short term, I want to finish the Arm and Only Embrace Tour. That's absolutely a dream. I want to help these two guys out that I'm promoting right now uh, with the Gaia album, uh, so I'm super excited for them. Um, and then a state of trance, uh, I'm moving into the next level with that again. Can't say too much about it, but uh, uh, the show will remain as it is, but I want to move to the next level, and uh, you'll see soon how we're going to do that. Super excited about that. Um, and I want to stick to that, you know. Um, trance is not a fixed sound, even though for some people it is, but for me, trance is moving on. And you see that, fortunately, there's a lot of new sounds in trance coming, and I want to add to that. I want to do some uh, really special collaborations. And uh, yeah, I have a 10-year plan as well. Um, which has something to do with Arm and Only as well. Can't reveal too much, but uh, yeah, just work on a lot of new music, man. That's uh, that's what I'm doing. I've never. It's funny. I've had. I have two kids now, and I've never been so productive. I've released so, so many tracks and uh, so much so much different stuff out there. I want everybody to know that EDC is a place of love. It's a place of harmony. It's a sanctuary for our fans, and we are so excited to welcome everybody. Um, and we don't want people to think about the negative. Uh, this is a time to come to escape, uh, to relax, to enjoy, to be there for the music, to be there for each other, and most importantly, to love, because that's how you defeat terrorism, is just by loving everybody and by accepting each other, and that's really what EDC is about. Really what you need is you need education, you need medical response, and you need the community coming together to take care Consistent. of each other and to look out for each other. And that's yes. what we should really be focusing on. And I am just incredibly in awe of all the people who came up here and shared their stories because really we have a very sort of just very tiny limited conversation about drug use in this country. And that's one of the things that needs to change. It's not just a festival issue, it's a wider cultural issue. So I think it's, it's really about both the men on the inside with the power and, and having those allies and just them even being conscious of some of their biases and then the women who have made it uh, giving back tenfold to the women below and behind. Right. I think people who run hiring at businesses have a responsibility to uh, think about innovative ways to adjust their hiring, to remove bias from their hiring practices. Uh, I have a fantasy about inventing a technology that makes interviewing for a job uh, uh, completely anonymous uh, so that skills can be measured rather than, you know, the vibe you get off of someone across the table, which is where bias comes in. I think that's incredibly important. I think you mentioned five out of 50 some people in, the, in this power list. I would, I would challenge men to ask themselves what they think that means, because I think there's only two ways to look at that list. Women are incompetent, or there's something wrong with the system. And since I don't believe women are incompetent, it just seems in, in, incredibly obvious to me that there's something wrong with the environment and system. I think like the best way to collab with anyone is to have like a real connection with them because then you're both on the same page, you, you're both able to be honest with each other in a studio and challenge each other. I think when someone's kind of forced two people in a room, it seems like an arranged marriage or something, I don't it, know. It definitely never works. Yeah, and I, I just think like I'm not a good networker, I never have been. Um, every time I've ever met anyone, it's, it's literally just been because we've connected as people and we kind of get it. You know, and, and that for me, like you just need chemistry in a studio. Sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it won't. That's just how I find people. Um, but I mean, as far as like actually, I agree with you as far as like when you meet them, but there has to be that point where you actually find the person. Yeah. You know, um, and Trying. I guess to touch on that, there's, for me personally, uh, I mean, it's anything from my manager will send me a vocalist and be like, yo, just listen to it. She's amazing. Or, um, I mean, I posted something on Facebook the other week and it was like, I need vocals to make tracks with because I, like when I start a track, if I have a vocal to work with, it's always better than if I just start from scratch. Um, One more. 
then he's going to get them.